Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you we can bring every need of ours to you. And Lord, this morning, we, we need your grace. We don't want this to be a routine opening of our word and just what we do every Sunday morning, but Lord, we desire to hear from you in this moment. That's our greatest need, and so will you visit your people? Will you visit us this morning? Speak through your word, Holy Spirit, have your way, and as we encounter you, just shape our lives. Shape them forever for the way that you intend this morning, for the good of us as your church. And we know this is only possible because of the intercession of our high priest, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have you ever experienced, like, genuine greatness? And, and when I say that, I mean not somebody who's pretty good at what they do or, you know, watching it on TV. But in one of those moments where you happen to encounter just this transcendent greatness. And you, it, it, it is, it's hard, you're experiencing it firsthand, and it's hard to define or quantify what that looks like. But when you see it, you immediately just, just those rare chances, you immediately recognize, oh my, that's something different. And I, I had one of those experiences when I was in college. I, I know nothing about music. You don't have to spend a lot of time around me to know this guy knows nothing about music. But we got a ticket. I did know there's this guy. His name's Yo-Yo Ma. And if you don't know who he is, he's a cello player. And do yourself a favor and Google the guy. He's amazing. He's unreal. Um, he's, he's possibly the greatest cello player of all time. I, I'm by, by no means an authority to say that. But after having seen him play, I'm like, there's, I can't believe anybody would ever play better than that guy. So from the second he walks out on stage, right, he, he comes out on stage. He has a Stradivarius cello is what he plays with. And he's supposed to play with a full orchestra. But from the second he walks out, he's just the guy that you watch. You immediately go to him, and there's just it, it's, you, the bow flows in his hand, and he's making sounds that you've never heard before as far as just beautiful, uh, beautiful music. And, you know, like I said, you just immediately recognize this, he's, this is a qualitatively different kind of guy when it comes to playing. And um, you, it's one of those engrossing times. You just kind of, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but when you've, you've been around something like that, you're just totally engrossed. Like you start to lose track of what's going on around you, and you start to lose track of, you know, how long this guy's been playing. You just want to keep playing. And greatness has that kind of impact on us. It has that kind of movement to us. It, it moves us to desire to be like that in some way. And when somebody does it like that, there's also a temptation that comes along, too. Because they make it look effortless. And just completely effortless. Like they were born that way. But there's this intuitive difference. There's a, there's a difference that we know that that's not true. For them to get to that level, for them to achieve that kind of greatness, it took un, you know, just unquestioned commitment and desire. And they expressed that desire. It, it worked itself out. There's countless hours. There's countless hours of training, of perseverance, and of sacrifice. That's how they got to that level. And so this morning, as we come to this passage, and we come to a guy like Paul, it's easy to think, you, you start to see this guy, and you think, man, this is, this is the Apostle Paul. Like, this is greatness. This is what it means to, you know, he's, in the, he's a, one of those rare, like, first ballot Hall of Famers for Christians, you know? And it's easy to think that for him, for a guy like that, you start looking at him, he just becomes St. Paul. He, he, he kind of leaves humanity and ends up above humanity. And, and it's easy to think, well, it just must have come easy for the guy. He must, for his Christianity, he must, it must have been easy for him. And, what, and it seems so unattainable at times that we feel like, oh, I can never be that. And it's tempting, it's tempting to think that way. But this morning, this text, we get to pull the curtain back a little bit. We get to go back to see the hours. We get to go back to see the desire. We get to go kind of check under the hood. And, and Paul's Christian life, it's, it's laid bare right before us in these words. That's the privilege. Of, that's why I love this text. It's just a privilege for us to see what, what Paul, how he strove. It didn't come easy for him. Contrary to, it's kind of surprising. It it's almost surprising to realize it didn't come easy for Paul. We can't imitate. He, has, he was an apostolic gifting. We can't imitate that. But here's the thing. We can imitate his pursuit because ultimately what his pursuit was is the same pursuit we received through the gospel of Jesus Christ. For Paul, the prize, and you heard testimony about it just a second ago, the prize of knowing Jesus Christ, it's created a new life-giving aim for him. He still has to run to obtain it, 
But the difference is that now he's, suching, he's running in such a way that he can gain that. He's running to gain that prize. And just like it was true for Paul, the same is true for us. The glory of gaining Christ, the value of gaining Jesus Christ, it propels a single-minded pursuit. That's, that's, that's what it does. It starts to work itself out. It propels the single-minded pursuit in our lives. And we're going to see this morning, there's three kind of just three aspects in this text of what that pursuit looked like in Paul's life. First, we're going to see the foundation of our pursuit. It's the exact same foundation Paul had. Second, we're going to see the method. That's in verse 12. Second, we're going to see the method of our pursuit. That's in verse 13. And finally, we're going to see this goal. What's, what's our end game? What's the goal of our pursuit? So first, the foundation of our pursuit. <clears throat> we can't get the order wrong here at the outset. You can't get the order wrong. That's key. That's important. There's a gospel foundation that it has to be in place. It has to be in place. We don't run. This is important. This is, this is foundational. We don't run in order to achieve God's, God's grace, to, to achieve his kindness, to achieve his approval. We instead run because we belong to God. That, that's the foundation. Paul has every confidence that the church in, in Philippi, as he's writing to them, he has every confidence that they already belong to God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's, that he, he, in fact, he says early on in, in chapter 1, he tells them at the outset of the letter, he says, For I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And it was exactly this confidence that allowed him to go on and then say in chapter 2, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for, for it is God who is at work in you. You can't, for Paul knew this, you can't work out what you don't have. It can't work itself out if it's not our union. And it's this shared gospel identity. It's the shared gospel identity as those who belong to the king that gives Paul this freedom. It allows him to freely and humbly admit in verse 12 that he's just like him. He's a work in progress. He's alluded to, as I mentioned, he's alluded to this multiple times in the letter. Look in verse, look in verse 12. He says, I have not already obtained this. Or am already perfect. You hear that word already. And it, I, want, I want to hear it right. It's, that's not a word of frustration. Like I already, I should already be. It's not a word of frustration from Paul. What that is, it's not failure. He's not thinking of failure in terms of, that's a confident expectation. I'm, I'm not already there, but I'm on my way. I'm going to make it. And that kind of confidence is important. It should immediately grab our attention because that's the kind of confidence that we desire. That's the kind of fuel that we need in our lives. And you can see that come through in this text, still down in verse 12. He says, I haven't obtained this. He says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. You hear that, you hear that kind of parallel right there? I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has... And, and that term, it's the same term. And it literally is... There's, it's, it's almost like a, a really intense, I'm going to seize it. I, I press on to seize it because Jesus Christ has seized me. There's this relationship that's there that's, that's key. That's his underpinning. That's his underpinning. That's the gospel foundation before anything else that Paul does. It's his gospel foundation. He says, I'm going to press on to seize it. And why? There's that relationship. Jesus Christ has seized me. It's not theological jargon or a socially acceptable approach to just, you know, kind of have a tempered, standoffish following of Jesus. If Christ Jesus has not made Paul his own, then pressing on is worth than worthless. But for Paul, this is the cause of the whole thing. This is the root of the whole thing. This is his driving force. The scandal of the whole thing is that Jesus had made Paul his own. And you're supposed to feel that. You're supposed to feel it. We've, we've been walking through Acts, and you guys have experienced who, who Saul of Tarsus was and the things he was doing in the early church. The early church certainly felt that about Paul. When they were getting testimonies of this guy belongs to Jesus now, there's a, it was a scandalous thought. There was, a thought. there was that moment of them thinking, that guy? How does that guy belong to Jesus? We know who he is. There is no way. And, they, and it, took, it took intercessors and supernatural intercession 
for them to convince them this guy could belong to Jesus. Yet the same is true for us. If we're, if we're counting wins and losses, if we had a win and loss column, and we had a win column, if we're in the win column, is every reason why we should belong to Jesus. And in the loss column is all the reasons why we shouldn't. It's, it, there's zero. There's zero. In fact, the, the list gets longer every day of reasons that I can tell you every day. I can, go, I can go to bed at night and think of more reasons why I shouldn't belong to Jesus Christ. If anything could possibly be logged in your favor, from a human terms, Paul's already said earlier in the chapter, I got more of those. He said, I, I was a Jew of Jews. If you look up at the beginning of chapter 3, he says, I was a Jew of Jews. I was circumcised on the eighth day. In regards to the law, I was blameless. I got a lot of things working for me that, that you guys don't have. And he says, but I, there's nothing there. And here's why. Because even when I had all those things, Paul says, I hated Jesus. I hated Jesus. And he proved it by his persecutions in the church. We too, naturally, left to ourselves, we hate Jesus. And a lot of times we couch it in our civility. But get this. Even venom diluted by good works, it's still meant to kill. It's still meant to say, hey, you know what? If I can do enough things, Jesus, thanks, see your way out. I don't, I don't really want you around. We're by nature his enemies. This is who we are immediately before Jesus intervenes in our life. It's the condition of enmity that, that you and I all were born with. There's nobody who doesn't suffer from this. There's nobody here that didn't... That didn't have this when they were born. But that's the condition that we were in when we heard the gospel. We heard his declaration of peace. God is the one who declared peace through the finished work of his son. Maybe it was a sermon preached that you heard. Maybe it was somebody who invited you to a Bible study in college. Or maybe it was parents that loved you and prayed for you and shared the gospel with you. Whatever it looked like, Jesus Christ was in that message laying a hold of you. He was claiming you as his own. He was declaring peace to you, that you are no longer enemies with him because of what he did at Calvary. It's easy to think that Paul's in a different category, but that's simply not true. His experience of Jesus, as you saw the Damascus Road, his experience was unique, yes, but his salvation was not. His salvation was not. Listen, the, Jesus, the price that Jesus paid for Paul, he paid for you. It didn't cost any less. The life, the perfect life that he lived was our righteousness. The substitutionary horrific death that he died, it was when we were his enemy, it says, when he died in our place. It was a substitutionary death to pay a crushing debt that we were never going to pay to God. That's our basis. That's the foundation. It isn't having it all together. It isn't having to pursue God's favor by trying harder. It's getting to pursue God himself. Jesus has seized you, and he's not going to let go. So we run to seize it for ourselves. He's made you his own, so make him your own. That's a sure footing. There's a sure footing here. It's worth this single-minded pursuit because we have this. That's, a, it's, that's the foundation of our pursuit. That's the foundation of Paul's pursuit. That's the foundation of our pursuit. And it is a gospel foundation. It's a gospel foundation. Secondly, we see that there's a method to this pursuit. Paul has a way of going about this. It's in verse 13. It's characterized by a singularity. From the very beginning, there's just a, it's, there's, you see two sides to it, but it's a single thought. <clears throat> Look in verse 13. Paul says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, here's the two sides, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. You can't be increasingly shaped by the future while still continuing to cling or even being held captive by the things in your past. Commentators speculate exactly as to what Paul was referencing when he says forgetting the things that are behind. I I really do think in God's kindness, he's talking about his whole life. We have enough of his bio 
either between Acts or between him telling it to us. We have enough of his bio that if you look in his backstory, you can begin to see your own life in there. And that's important. There's enough preserved there that you can see yourself there. That's important. Because if anybody else but a guy like Paul says this, it can sound like a cliche. Forget what's behind. Or worse than that, it can almost sound cruel. It's easy to start thinking, well, Paul, that's easy for you to say. That's, that, that may be easy for you to say, just forget what's back there. It's easier said than done, Paul. Do you have any idea the things that I've been through? Do you know the ways that I, I've suffered? Paul, do you know the things that I've done? I guarantee you, Paul, if you did, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say forget what's behind. Listen, if I could snap my fingers and just forget it, I would. But it kind of, it just keeps coming back. And most of the time, it keeps coming back in the worst possible moments. It sneaks back in. If that's how you feel, if you hit a text like this and you think, man, I, I wish I could, if that's how you feel, I want you to know that God understands. He, he picked a guy to write this. God, God inspired him, but he picked a guy to write this. Not in a vacuum. He didn't pick a robot in a vacuum. He picked a guy like Paul. He, he picked a guy specifically who could speak tenderly and compassionately to us this morning. He's... This is not Paul's way of minimizing pain. This is not him suppressing his past or giving some sort of hollow pep talk. This is a guy, this is a guy whose past would not allow him to do that. It wouldn't allow him to do it. Listen, he knows his sin so much that he can call himself the chief of sinners. He's been scorned, mocked, ridiculed, shouted down, beaten senseless, stoned, shipwrecked, and slandered. He's despaired of life itself, been re betrayed repeatedly. He's been deserted by all his friends, even in his deepest trials. He's been accused by those who hate him, and get this, he's been accused by those in the churches that he planted. He's been despised for seeking the well-being of others. He suffered chronically, physically, from a thorn in the flesh. He's seen what we would consider spectacular success. And yet at the same time, he says he daily bears scars in his body. He, he lives in this constant anguish that even the things that he's accomplished will somehow fall apart. Trying to hold it together. Even when he writes this letter, he's actually in chains while he's writing this. So almost any category that you can imagine is in Paul's past. That's the guy God picked to write this. So for Paul, forgetting, forgetting isn't dismissing the past like it doesn't matter. For Paul, forgetting isn't just looking in the mirror and giving yourself a pep talk and saying, hey, you know what, just do better. Pull yourself up and do better next time. Leave that behind. No, for, for Paul, forgetting is to believe that God intends to finish the work that he began. It's fighting to hold on to the promises of God. The things behind, no matter how large their shadows can loom, or maybe sometimes how much like the good old days they seem to be. They don't ultimately define Paul. They don't ultimately define who he's going to become. Paul won't allow those things in his past to so dominate his focus that they either take the place of functional authority in his life, or they become the thing that he ultimately hopes in. Who and what lay ahead for Paul? They're going to have final say in his life. That's what's going to govern his life. You can hear this passion in his voice. He says, forgetting, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. There's this athletic metaphor. It's a straining, right? And, and it's a fitting to use that here because he's saying, look, every stride matters. Every attempt counts. It's a practical passion because runners in a race, they can't waste steps. That's why we don't just forget, but there's also this, there's this replacing that has to come into view. Something greater. You're not, you're not just 
saying no, you're saying yes. We strain forward to the things that have been promised. Perfection does come at the end of our earthly lives. It's been promised to us in the gospel. However, that doesn't mean that we don't currently have all that we need right now for life and godliness in this world. Christian living is not about taking blow after blow after blow until somehow you make it to heaven and you receive this resurrection power, overcoming power. There's an already not yet aspect to it. For sure the best is yet to be, but the better is already here. You've already been born again to a living hope. You've already received the Holy Spirit. He's already been given to us. We're already in the church. Listen, pressing on and exerting effort, it's not something that we can do in our own strength. This is not something that we have the ability to do. It takes God-given power. It takes God-given means, and he's eager to do that. He's eager to pour that power out in our lives. He desires, we've been, I know a lot of you have been studying the Holy Spirit in, in these classes in the morning. That, that's part of that. He's eager to pour that out in our lives. And one of the ways that he does that, we've been given access to this through what I would say, I call them grace-packed means. They're means that God has given us. What often appear like simple, routine Christian efforts, disciplines. They're not aimless Christian habits. Listen, they have a focus. They're life-defining patterns. The mystery of this is that even when they don't feel like it, even when they feel like some sort of rote or mundane duty that we're doing, the cumulative effects of God working in our lives through them, they're significant. They make a difference. And if we ignore them and if we look the other way and we don't have this method in place, then the deadening effects are significant too. So we can do these things in faith. We do them in faith. We connect them back to the gospel. That's how we do them. They are God's ways to increasingly reveal himself. Here, here's how we do that. They're God's way to increasingly reveal himself as for us, to remind us of his love, and to shape us into who we will be forever. Like Paul, we, we daily have the privilege and we daily have the necessity to turn our gaze upward. I don't naturally do it. So what does that look like? We talked about it's, it's, it's got to be faith-filled. We're trusting God here. And it's spirit-enabled. There's a, there's a power that God has given us, that's granted us to be able to do these things. So we can do them with faith, right? We can do them with faith and we can do them with hope. These are not, we don't come to them defeated before we start, right? But at the same time, it's got to look like something. If it doesn't look like something, then, it, then, then, then how does it work itself out? How does it begin to change us? So I, a few things just came to mind, and, and I want to shape them in light of that, right? So these are things you already know, but I want to shape them in light of that. So here's a few things. It looks like reading the Bible expectantly because we believe that God himself is talking to us through these pages. It looks like humbly being able to cast cares the cares of the day, as they come, moment by moment, being able to cast those on the Lord because we know that we have a, high, a heavenly Father who presently watches over us, that we have a spirit who helps us. He's alongside us, and we have a high priest who's interceding for us even now. Looks like what we're doing this morning, gathering to worship, aware that this right here, this is a tangible representation. It's a revelation of the destiny that we're going to be saved, that we've been saved to fulfill. Looks like picking up clothes for the fifth time today around the house and somehow smiling because you know that God is at work in your home through your sacrifice. Looks like forgiving the guy at the office that stabbed you in the back to get a promotion because you know, you know you've been forgiven. And you know that one day God's going to make every wrong right. You can trust him. It's like battling that remaining sin in your life because we've been promised that, one, that, that the final decisive victory of that sin had in your life, it's been broken because of Jesus. It doesn't own you anymore. And one day you are going to be free of it forever. It looks like sharing burdens, joys, and struggles in care groups because we have fellowship around the gospel. We have fellowship with one another. We're not walking this alone. That's by faith we do those things. It's not just something that we, we, we have 
to have. This is a way of trusting God in the gospel together. Looks like using your spiritual gift to, to serve the body, knowing that God is empowering what seem like meager efforts to make eternal differences. As you show up and you set up and you do what the Lord has called you to do and gifted you with, it, it, it's make, you're making a difference. Looks like reaching out to that classmate because we've been entrusted with the message of the gospel of reconciliation, and we believe that, that God can save them too. Looks like working is under the Lord and not man, because we know that God sees, and he's, he's the one who ultimately rewards. Going to work, putting in our best, even if nobody's ever going to see it. Looks like doing everything we can to pursue unity in the church, because these are our forever brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. That list could go on and on and on, couldn't it? But you see how this method, it's a method of living that involves forgetting what's behind. It involves straining towards what's ahead. We're talking about a method here. That's that's what that's looking like, playing out. Do you see how trust in the future, trust in our future is so useful right here in the present? It's so practical. It meets you right where you are. We live in light of that instead of living in light of our past or the things that are immediately in front of us. Listen, I woke up this morning feeling this way. We are poor on our own. We're very poor on our own. If you try to wake up and live this way, you will find that you don't have any money to spend to buy that. But here's the thing. We get to borrow from tomorrow's riches so that we can spend them right now. It's the already part. We're borrowing so we can spend. We're drawing by faith. It's why we have to know and remind ourselves of God's promises, because those are the things that not only inform us, but they transform us. They tell us what we can borrow from. They're meant to be grabbed a hold of so we can use them. Anybody who has ever achieved greatness at any level, you know what they were told probably somewhere along the way? Somebody probably looked at them and said, you know what? You've got a future in this. And they believed them enough to go after it. They believed there was something there they could go after. Same is true for us. I hope you're feeling this this morning. This this isn't the latest how-to. It's not like five steps to a better you. Not a quick fix. It's more radical than that. As much as I'd sometimes like to use a cheat code, you know, one of those easy buttons from the commercials, you know, just press the easy button. As much as I'd like to do that, there's no shortcut. It's nothing less, the method is nothing less than messy because we're sinners. It's messy. It's not going to be perfect, but it's active. Messy, active cooperation with God's. They're glorious, and there's an expressed purposes. He's expressed those things so we know them now for a reason. He's given us this to tell us now for a reason. He's got expressed purposes, and, and, and he wants you to know them so that you can use them. And he, he wants for those things to just change our thoughts, to change our thinking, right? We're transforming. We're forgetting what's behind, straining forward to what's ahead, and it starts changing our thinking. Because as we do that, we begin to believe what Paul says. The upward call is worth it. The upward call is worth it. As those means to start to play out in your life, you'll begin to realize, you know what? I do desire to be with Jesus. I do desire to know him more. That's what leads us to this last point. This is the goal of our pursuit. This is Paul's goal. This is our goal. It's in verse 14. He says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. Where? In Christ Jesus. That's Paul's goal. Prizes have this way of internally motivating us. I'm, I'm, in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm like our chocolate lab in this. I love getting rewarded, right? And retailers know this. They, they prey on people like me because they realize I will spend twice as much in their store so I can get some free stuff, right? Because it feels really, really good when you get to the end and you have these points that you can cash in. It just feels good. <clears throat> and, and we just want to do it. I mean, rewards, they work for us. 
And, and the same, Paul's saying here, look, the greatest prize, the greatest prize that I could ever have is gaining Christ Jesus. So he has this intense anticipation of seeing this payoff. He knows there is nothing, he knows for sure, there's nothing in this life that's going to compare to seeing Jesus face to face. It was the light of that glory that allowed Paul, in the middle of his afflictions, to even say the things that we've just read about, to even say on that day they're going to be light and momentary. Somehow he had that perspective. On that day, everything is going to be more than worth it. Not just worth it, but more than worth it. That's why the beginning of that, verse 14, he's saying this is according to this goal. It's according to that goal that I press on. The word that, that he uses there, it's, just, it's the same word, interestingly enough, that he used earlier about pursuing the church. When he talked about how he was pursuing to, to uh, persecute the church, that kind of intensity that we had seen in Paul's life. It's the exact same word, but now it's directed toward Jesus Christ. Exact same level of intensity. Tragedy of the fall is this. Tragedy of the fall is that it's cut us off. It's cut us off from the very things that every human being deep down longs for. We have a deep, inside of ourselves, intrinsically, we have a deep desire to be with God and we have a deep desire to know God. The rest of our human existence is, is a, really a pitiful, pitiful tale. It's one of pursuing worth, of one of pursuing love, pursuing something, doing something that matters. And so we run, run from one thing to the next thing, one relationship to the next, only to find that none of them are ever able to make that connection back, ever able to satisfy. Paul knew that to be a Christian is to have that relationship, the one that we all desire to be restored. It's what he means, that's what he means when he says the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What the call includes, it matters, but who is involved is what matters most of all. We're the ones now who get to we get to hear his voice speak tenderly to us. We're the privileged who can see and rejoice in his glory. Even if not fully or perfectly, we can truly understand his ways. We're able to reflect his character in our lives. And soon our lives will have their intended purpose of eternally being with him in the state that we were meant to be fully restored. This morning, do you, do you see that as your privilege, Christian? Despite what you've been told, your end is not one of many good ends to pick from. A lot of different viable options. The end of every other life that's been pursuing and chasing anything else is permanent and utter hopelessness. That's the end of chasing all these other things. But your prize is going to be greater than you can have imagined. And here's the thing, it's guaranteed, it's fixed, it isn't going to move. You aren't going to get to the end and find out that Jesus was a liar. Instabilities and insecurities, that's, that's part of our daily existence, right? That's just all we know. In fact, some of the best advice I ever got from somebody, he looked at me and he said, you know, just know life isn't going to go the way that you think it's going to go. And, and that was great advice. It's proved true over and over again. But one day it won't be that way. Jesus is not, nor will he ever be, content to make you his own on paper only. Yes, right now we're positionally seated with Christ in the heavenly places. But one day we're going to be seated with Christ. His far-reaching work is going to have its completion. And while we don't know all that that means, we don't know everything that means, there's enough in these pages. There's enough that's here to get you there. His glory and his purposes in your life, they, they can't be thwarted. We sang about it this morning. The it is finished, it is finished at, at Calvary, that word that was spoken, has always been leading you and will continue to lead you to the it is done that's in Revelation. It's always been headed there. Listen, that's why our relationship with him is worth leaving everything else behind. God's terms 
They're not fluid. You aren't going to get to the end of the end of the Bible and find it in fine print. Believer in Jesus, your rest is fixed and it's secure and it's right around the corner. Even, even if it's still decades away, there's a finish line in sight. And so that is what Paul has seen. That's his goal. That's, that's what he's after. So we press on today, knowing that in the Lord, it's in the Lord that our labor is not in vain. We aren't the first to walk these trails. In fact, our history goes back a little bit further than we sometimes even think. There's, there's guys in the Old Testament, and they cut them in. They cut in these paths that we're walking in. And you, we owe them a great deal. Hebrews 11 just talks about one after the other. And it describes their lives. It describes their earthly lives. It, it talks about who they are and what they did. And it talks about just what their final end was. What was their, end, what was their goal? And, it's, and, and so one after the other, he lines them up. The writer of Hebrews just lines them up. And we get to verse 13. You don't have to turn there. But he just gives this snapshot, encapsulates all their lives in this snapshot. And I think, I think it's a wonderful way of describing this. He says, these, talking about the ones he's just described, he says, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear they are seeking a homeland, If they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return, forgetting what's behind. You hear that there? But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. There's that straining towards what's ahead. And here's the prize. Here's here's what they were after. Therefore, God. God is not ashamed. God is not ashamed to be called their God. Isn't that that a striking statement? God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. As I was preparing this message, I I was just praying, and one particular group just kind of came to my mind. And I don't I don't know if is anybody here that's particularly dealing with this? But this was the group that came to my mind. And you may be sitting here, and you're listening to this text, and you're thinking, this sounds great. That sounds really, really good. But it feels so far from my daily existence, I mean so far, that I don't even know how this text applies to me at all in any way. My existence feels a lot more like barely hanging on then it feels like some sort of striving to the finish, you know, where you're running the last 100 meters and you know, everybody's cheering you on at the finish line. That's not what it feels like. Well, here's, here's a glorious truth. Truth is that hanging on, hanging on, even if it means hanging on by a fingernail that you just barely got in there, it's still striving. Still striving. Listen, Paul, he, he isn't writing these things to add one more thing to the Philippians to say, hey, oh, and by the way, do this. One more thing that you may may or may not get right, but try this out. That's not what he's doing here. It's not what he's doing for us this morning. He's coming alongside us. He knows what it's like to hurt. He knows what it's like to to struggle. And his desire in these verses, it's, it's to come alongside us and to encourage us, to sustain us, to say, let's keep going. Listen, the goal isn't to finish ahead of everybody else. You, you can make a really strong point. The goal is to make sure that everybody finishes. The prize of glorification, it's not cheapened by those who have to limp or crawl across the finish line. It's not cheaper. The greatness that awaits you on the day when God finishes his work in your life will immediately make every small effort and every shortened breath worth it. Celebration won't have ended because it took you too long to run. Elizabeth Prentice, she's a hymn writer. She wrote, More Love to Thee, O Christ. I think she just captures this wonderfully with this quote. She says, 
but when we are not sending any branches upward. We may be sending roots downward. Perhaps in the time of our humiliation, when everything else seems a failure, we're making the best kind of progress. Church, we have a goal to pursue. His name's Jesus Christ. And one day his masterpiece is going to be done in our lives, but it's being painted right now. If you look down, glance, glance down in verse 16. He says, look, look, only, only let us hold true, brothers. Let us hold true, church, to what we have attained. I want to land there. I want to land right here. Because this is where Paul landed and because it just fits so well with how I feel about you. Think back to what God has done in our midst. And he's done it through the gospel, hadn't he? He hasn't done it through nothing we can take credit for. He's done it through the gospel. How he's changed our own hearts. How he's changed our families. How he's built our church. It is him doing it. He's doing it in ways, in simple ways. Ways that we would look at and think, well, there's nothing much. There's no magic in that. But there's God doing these things. If it doesn't always feel that way this morning, we have reasons, listen, we have reasons abounding to pursue in hope. We have a lot of reasons. You can look around the room and you can see a lot of reasons, tangible reasons to, abound, to, to press on in hope. One day we're going to make it look effortless. It's going to look like we were born that way because we have been born again. But until that day, let's, let's press on. Let's press on remembering that we have a foundation. We have a reason to press on. There's a gospel foundation to our pursuit. We have a method in pursuing. And we have a goal. We have a goal to pursue. Change from glory into glory until we take our place. And every crown that we receive will have the highest privilege of gladly laying down at the feet, the scarred feet, of the one who has made us his own, overwhelmed at seeing his greatness with unveiled eyes. We're on our way to that day. We're here now, but that's where we're headed. Church, we press on to make it our own because Christ Jesus has made us his own. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for hope in these words. We thank you that you've addressed us this morning through a man like Paul. We thank you that, that we can see hope in these words, in the gospel, because of what your son Jesus has done. We thank you that we get to participate in this process because by so doing, we are bringing glory to the one who died for us. And we are fulfilling what you've called us to do. And Spirit, take these truths and, 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 and work them out in our lives. Bring them, bring them, to, bring them to mind often. As we, as we walk out, the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, and so many times we walk out, and we want to we do that. But we need your help. So Spirit, just come, and as we talked about, just empower us this morning. Empower us as your church to continue to press on and to pursue you. And, and Lord, I pray that you would be our prize. If, if there's other things that have, that have caught our vision, other than you, Jesus, would you remove those things so that we can see you? So you would be honored. And this is your, we're your church. So you would be glorified. And we pray this in your name. Amen. I want to just seize a moment, if I can, right now. Um, obviously, so many things uh, in that message just motivate us to run with the grace God gives us towards him. Looking forward to that day. Um, but when, when Bart was talking about uh, those that feel like they're, they're limping, limping, 
towards the finish line, and, and even I think use the expression, the prize isn't diminished if you limp across the line. Um, I, I just wonder, that there, there may be people that just in a unique way uh, in your season right now at home, personally in your pursuit of the Lord, awareness of some ongoing battle with sin, um, family issues, that, that you feel like that limping runner. Um, I would just like to take a moment and, and invite you to come forward for prayer. Um, we, we just love praying for people after the meeting. God's Word does things in our hearts. Uh, it transforms us. It softens us. It invites us. It reminds us. And it's good to respond to those things, um, especially when there's this unique sense, I think God is in a particular way encouraging me in my season right now. He's, he's aware of my season right now in that word. Um, so if that's you and you feel like you're limping in some way, uh, you don't feel like you're running right now, I just want to invite you to come forward as we conclude. And I'll be down here, pastors will be down here, uh, community group leaders and their wives will be here just to pray for you. Uh, please come forward. Let us just pray for you that God would strengthen you along the way. Um, for the rest of us, um, we have a, a little bit of a, a unique opportunity here. I know many of you um, know Bart and love him and would love to hear uh, just a, a quick greeting or update from the kids and so forth. And so we, what we thought we'd do is try to make that a little bit more accessible. So we have some um, light, very light refreshments in the back. Um, Bart's going to be back there. Uh, just kind of standing, so don't make him stand there alone. That'd be awkward. Uh, go, go back there and, and shake his hand at least. Give him a hug. Tell him you're praying for him. Um, if you haven't been praying for him, tell him you'll start doing that now. Um, and tell him you just love to hear how his kids are doing, his, his um, wife, and, and so forth. And just greet him. Uh, I'm sure he would be grateful for that, benefit for the chance to do that. There are, there are light refreshments. What that means is um, if, if moms and dads could watch all eight-year-old boys uh, to avoid, you know, the 19 cookie bowl. Um, so if we can avoid that, that would be great. Just keep an eye on There's a little bit for everybody should be. Uh, and for those who would like prayer, please come forward. We'll pray for you. For the rest of us, have a grace-filled week. We'll see you this week or next Sunday.